All right, in our next example, what we're going to do is we're going to explore a couple new features of the question uh, authoring library. So the first one is ways of dealing with null. Um, null is a very common input in Java. It's something we need to teach students to deal with. And there's ways of controlling whether or not null gets passed to your code. Um, the second thing we're going to look at is ways to add um, manually written incorrect examples to your problem. Uh, to supplement the ones that are generated by mutations. So mutation is super useful and is a great way of generating incorrect code, but there's certain uh, types of errors that mutation is not going to generate that we might want to include to make sure that the test suite can properly generate tests for them. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, I've set up this uh, problem called fancy compare that uh, and you can see the description ID is two string arguments. If they're equal, you return negative one. Otherwise, you return the length of the longer string. Uh, because we're dealing with integer lengths here, I've already added a, a mutation, a disabled mutation here, because I know this is going to break. I know that replacing the greater than with greater than or equal to here does not affect the correctness, and so I've already disabled this. Okay, so I'm ready to try validating this, and I'm going to run uh, test focus because this test is focused, and we're going to see what happens. Um, and so, you know, keep in mind, whenever there are object parameters, um, questioner will use null as inputs to those. Um, and so the first thing that happens here is that it fails. And the reason it fails is it says, look, your solution threw when I used null. And you didn't tell me that you expected it to throw. You can tell me that. But in this case, it's pointing to a problem here. And, and here's the deal. In general, we don't want our solution to handle null by just dying, right? In this case, there's no explicit handling of null that's included in the problem. There are two options, handle null properly, and there's several ways to do that, either through checks using if and some special value to return or through assert, or make sure that null isn't used as part of testing. In previous examples, we've seen a couple of ways of suppressing input. So one was filter parameters, you can go back and review that in the, in the sort of lesson on that particular feature. Uh, the other one was to essentially take full control over the parameter generation process by writing our own random parameters method and also having a fixed parameters list that we provide. In this case, I don't want to do those things. It's too much work, right? You know, this is a problem that should work great with questioners built in automatic input generation. I just, if I could just get rid of null, right? If I could just get rid of null, everything would work fine. And it turns out there's a really easy way to get rid of null, right? And that is to use this not null annotation that's provided that I can use on parameters. That's part of our, uh, this is part of the Genesol, right? Genesol is the underlying testing library the questioner is built on top of. Um, okay. The other thing that we always want to do whenever we have inputs that could be null is tell, um, almost always we want to mention how to handle it, right? Um, unless we don't feel like students have seen null yet, um, you know, but usually we introduce null around the same time we introduce string, so it's usually a pretty safe bet that they have. Um, you usually want to put something in the description like, you can assume that both uh, strings are not null. Okay, so now what's going to happen is if I run this again, you're going to see that it's going to pass. And the reason it's going to pass is because null is never going to be passed to first or second, and the rest of the code is going to work fine. So that's one option. For handling this particular case. The other option is to use assert, okay? Um, and so let's, let's modify the description to say you should assert that both inputs are not null, right? And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say assert first is not equal to null, assert second is not equal to null, um, and let's try this, right? So this is another option. It's, again, we're telling students what to do, and then we're adjusting the solution so it follows that pattern. Now, if you started to learn how to think about how our test suite handles this type of situation, you may see a problem coming. And indeed, it fails validation, right? And the reason it fails is that it thinks that it found a mutation that should produce an incorrect submission that actually passed. And the reason is, when it finds assertions, the mutator will try removing them and see what happens, right? They'll say, okay, well, if this assertion really needs to be here, then removing it should cause a failure. In this case, the assertions are checking for inputs that will never be passed to the method because we have both the not null annotation and the assertion. And so the idea here is that I need to remove these not null annotations. 
And so, you know, one thing that, that should hopefully be uh, coming out as we go through these different examples is that it is very important when you write questions using this framework that there's a tight match between the description and the code. If the description says null will never be passed, but the code is checking for null, that'll probably fail the mutation tests, right? Because we'll remove that check and the code will still pass. So if you don't handle null, make sure it never gets passed and don't include code that handles it. If you handle null, make sure that you inform students about it. Either way, actually. Either way, tell students either you can assume not null, so they don't put a null check in, it's not needed, or, you know, here's what to do. Okay, so now I've taken off the not null annotations, I'm doing the assertion, and this should work fine. Um, one thing in passing I'll just mention as we wait for the test suite to finish running is that when we, um, so you might wonder how, like, how do you uh, compare, oh, there's one last thing to do, sorry, ah, we're not quite there yet. Um, final thing we need to do is we need to now tell the testing library that this particular question can throw, right? The reason that I added this is simply because I ran into problems when I was writing questions where I would make mistakes and the question would throw an exception and the test suite would think, oh, it's just correct, right? And then it would expect the submission to do the same thing. So when you have a question that can potentially throw, and this is anywhere, if it's a class-based question, if it can throw in the constructor, if it can throw in a method, you have to mark it, you have to basically say solution throws is equal to true, right? Um, and that's just some control mechanism to make sure that the solution is not throwing when you don't expect it, right? If you mark solution throws as true, it means the solution can throw, right? Um, and in this case, it does throw when first or second are null. Another thing to point out here is that um, first and second, um, oh, sorry, how we compare exceptions. So when we compare exceptions, we only compare the type. So students could add a message to the assertion here and it would still be fine, right? So when we, we compare uh, exceptions that are thrown, we only compare the types. We actually don't look at the message, right? Um, how we compare various things is, is important. Uh, right now, you know, the types of things we're returning are things that can be compared very easily, like ints and strings, where there's an obvious approach. When we start talking about building questions that return custom types, we'll have to delve a little bit more into the idea of how do we support that, right? How do we make sure those custom types can themselves be, um, be compared? Okay, cool, good. So second part of this is to show you how to use, to, to write your own uh, incorrect examples because there's times when we have some uh, idea of a mistake a student might make, but it's not a mistake that the, um, that the mutator is going to generate. So here's an example. It's a very, very common mistake in Java and it's right here and it has to do with equality, right? So in Java, when we test for equality with objects, we always have to use dot equals. But it's very tempting to just use the double equals operator. This is probably one of the most broken things about Java, period, but certainly for teaching CS1. This is very, very easy for students to get confused by. Now, we've done a lot of work in the testing library. Now, strings are even worse, right? Because in, with a string, sometimes you can get away with using double equals because of how Java optimizes for strings. So it's like totally broken. So the first object you introduce is broken with the quality, right? So it's like fantastic. Thank you, Java. Uh, for getting this right. Anyway, sorry about a little rant, but uh, it's super broken and it's frustrating. So, um, so we've done work in the underlying testing library to make sure that um, students can never get away with this, right? In the sense that uh, using double equals should never work where we need dot equals, even on strings, where sometimes it will work. And we've done some nasty things to get this to happen. Um, so let's see so so again basically we want to say okay well well let's make sure that we can catch the case where a student instead of using dot equals uses double equals on these strings this is not something that the mutation library will generate on its own we need to help um, and so here's how we do that so we create a sub package now the the location of the file that's annotated with correct marks the root of the question package any other code that lives inside that directory even if it's if it's in a uh, sub package is part of the same problem. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a package called incorrect bad equals. I usually uh, create a sub package called incorrect and then I create a bunch of sub packages inside that that describe what's wrong with it, right? And so here's uh, the easiest way to get started with this is to take your correct code and just cut and paste it into there, okay? You'll notice that it's also called question.java. That's important that it shares the same class name. That's one of the reasons it has to be in a sub package because Java is very 
angsty about rules about things. So you can't have two uh, question uh, classes in the same place, which sort of makes sense because of how Java names things, right? So I can't have two classes named question in the same package. So I have to put this into a sub package so that it, it will compile. Um, okay. Now, most of the stuff in here I don't need for what I'm about to do. So I'm going to take off the description. I'm going to take off, uh, I'll, I, I want to keep this suppression. I'll take off the correct and the wrap annotation. And instead, I'm going to add a new annotation from the questioner library called incorrect. This marks this piece of code as being wrong. And I can put whatever I want in here, right? I can, uh, as long as this is incorrect, it'll be used as part of the testing process. So essentially what happens is, I take the solution, I create a bunch of mutations, I make sure all those fail, and then it looks for anything in that uh, directory or subdirectories that you've marked with this incorrect annotation, and it makes sure that that fails also. So in this case, the thing I'm uh, concerned about is this. So I'm going to make the small change here to replace the correct object dot equals with the incorrect referential equals, you'll notice that idea even knows this is wrong, right? It's trying to stop me. It's like, no, no, it's wrong with compare strings. Okay, uh, I got to suppress this because I'm like, no, let me do this. I know it's wrong. I want to make sure that it, it, it is marked wrong, right? Okay, so now let's hit test focused again. So now, you know, basically the same process is happening uh, where I'm testing all the different mutations. But now as part of this, I'm going to throw in this additional incorrect example that I just wrote. And sure enough, um, it actually uh, works in the sense that the testing suite's able to identify this as being wrong. Um, it actually turns out, just it's a little bit of an embarrassing story, when I first started recording this, this was actually broken, right? And it was marked as correct, so I have to go back and do more work to fix the stupid string equality stuff. It's actually a real mess, it's terrible. Um, okay, so let's look at the validation report. Uh, let's open that up. Um, check it out. And what you're going to see is that uh, we used 18 incorrect examples. And the incorrect examples are marked as coming from either mutation or if we go all the way to the bottom, uh, we'll see this one here. So uh, the, the 15th incorrect example was incorrect annotated. And that means this is an incorrect example that you added, right? You put it into the right place, you marked it as incorrect, and it was also, and you'll see that when we passed two strings that were equal, these are not referentially equal, they are dot equals. Um, the uh, code that you provided as uh, incorrect was in fact marked as such by the testing uh, process. So good. Um, where you, I, I just said put it in the right spot. It actually doesn't matter where you put the things that you mark with incorrect. So you can decide. Like I said, my convention is I create an incorrect sub package and then I create sub packages inside there for each incorrect example that I want to add. Um, I would encourage you though, let the mutation do as much work as possible. So a very, very valid way to write these problems is to basically write it uh, first without any uh, thing that is manually marked as incorrect. And then only later go back and think, okay, like, is this going to actually work? You know, uh, now in this particular case, I am, uh, I, I will cross my heart now and promise you that we do test for strings in ways that should expose problems uh, between double equals and dot equals. So it's not like you have to test for this all over the place. Um, but there's certain types of problems like, you know, working with trees, right? So uh, getting right and left messed up right? Um, that's not something that our mutator is actually going to be able to, 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 to uh, cause failures in. So there's times when this is actually really appropriate. Um, you know, and, and you might um, sort of take an adversarial relationship with this, right? Where once you have these deployed and you start to experiment with them interactively, uh, or you might hear from students, it's like, oh, I got this code to work and it's wrong. And you're like, oh gosh, okay. Um, a good way to fix things is to bring the code into the to test suite um, and make sure it works. Um, or make sure the test suite can, uh, the testing process can identify this being incorrect. Okay, so next example, uh, we looked at two things. Uh, the first thing is, you know, what to do about null uh, using not null annotations. Uh, also, how to mark uh, a solution as something that might throw, uh, which this one does. And then also, you know, and this is pretty important, the ability to add your own incorrect code into the library to make sure that the testing process can identify it properly. Um, and so those are, uh, these are again, you know, pretty valuable and common things to do when authoring questions using this tool.